I really like uh, doing this kind of presentations because I have no idea what I'm going to talk about and normally I ask uh, Fred or Thomas or Andreas give me a topic and this time they gave me an equation so he sent me the email and I read A plus P plus AC plus IC 6150 equals PUC so I'm like, what should I do with this? There is no philosophical topic here. So I have to come up with something. And I said, okay, I'm going to try to figure out what are the components of the equation and then to figure out if it makes sense. So I think you read already the fine print because you should always read the fine print because if you don't read the fine print, you may end up in big trouble, okay? So, uh, many of you have been to many of my presentations and you know that I always start with these three questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And then finally, how are we doing it? So obviously, if we start with the first question, because I'm going to present everything based on answering these three questions, we start with what are we doing? So as Fred was mentioning, we are trying to define the power utility communications or PUC in the era of the smart grid. Why the smart grid? Because this is what is actually driving our industry today. And many of the things that are happening are driven by this movement that started more than 10 years ago in Europe and, and North America. So it has an impact on the way we do things and it has an impact on the requirements and I will try to briefly touch on these topics. Obviously we are talking about the power grid, so we need to think about what do we call the power grid and what makes the power grid a smart one. So I always to avoid any misunderstanding try to look for definitions on the web and in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the definition of a grid is a network of electrical transmission lines connecting multiplicity of generating stations to loads over a wide area. So this is quite a reasonable definition and I can agree with it based on my 40 something years of experience in this industry. Now, what you see on this figure is a graphical representation on the two layers, two main layers in the electric power grid. One of them is what I call the physical layer, which is on the bottom of the picture. And then on top is the operational layer. So we have the physical layer that according to the definition starts with the bulk generation, which is on the left the power is transferred through the transmission system to distribution substations, the voltage level is brought down to the distribution level and then using the distribution lines we go all the way to the customers. What is changing in the industry today is that we don't have just customers anymore. It's becoming much more complicated and what in the past was generation in central locations in large power stations with big synchronous generators is changing because now we have wind turbines, we have solar rooftop panels that is changing really the dynamic of the electric power system and the behavior of the protection, automation and control functions. Now obviously in order to keep the physical layer of the grid in operation, we need to take care of anything that happens there. And this is what is the responsibility of operations, the markets, the service providers, and the different protection automation and control systems that exist at each of these components of the transmission, distribution, generation, and prosumer level. Okay, so when we think about the P plus AC functions in a power utility system, actually they are 
overlapping functions, it is becoming more and more difficult to separate one from the other because, for example, in order to implement a protection function, you have to have monitoring of the state of the system, you have to implement certain automation functions in order to restore the state of the grid after a certain event occurs. You have to have the ability to control the system locally, remotely, at the system level, at the distribution level. You need to uh, monitor the quality of the power, which is becoming very critical because we have computer-driven loads that are sensitive to voltage variations. Situational awareness is becoming also a very critical requirement for the electric power grid because of the increased complexity of the grid itself. It is very important to be aware of what is the state. Are you close to a dynamic instability, to a voltage collapse, to frequency variations, etc., etc.? At the same time, if we are to analyze any event that occurs in the grid, we need to be able to record the behavior of the different components of the system at any moment in time, and at the same time also collect the event reporting from the different intelligent electronic devices or systems that are operating at the different levels of the system hierarchy. Now these functions, somebody can say, where are they located? Well, the answer is on my t-shirt, it depends. Because you may have a function that is local to the load, you may have a function that is local to the distribution feeder, to the substation, to the transmission level, regional functions, centralized functions, etc., etc. So that's why we need to look into the, not only the hierarchy of the system, but also we need to look into what are some of the drivers of the changes in the technology that we are seeing in the electric power grid. When I started my career, at a time when probably many of you were not even a project, meaning in uh, 75, okay, so this is 44 years ago, this is what we had. We had a substation in which everything was hardwired, okay? So you walk into the substation, you have the transformer, you have the bus, you have the breakers, you have the protection panels. The protection panels were wired to the substation primary equipment, to what we call the process today, and we were having a lot of issues related to this kind of system engineering. Why? Because when you have these long wires bringing the currents from the substation yard to the control house, to the relays, the electromechanical relays with high burden, one of the big issues that we were facing was city saturation. So we had to design our systems in such a way to try to minimize the effect of the city saturation or to use protection technology that can handle these kind of issues. The protection panels were with a limited functionality. They were performing just protection functions. So for measurement, for control, we have to have individual panels dedicated to each one of these major functions in the substation environment. So this is one of the challenges that we have been facing because many of these old substations that have been in service for many, many years are starting to deteriorate, their insulation is starting to fail, and people are starting to look into how to migrate to the next generation of technology in order to be able to do this transition in the most efficient way. Another challenge is safety. I don't know if you have been in a substation with an exploded instrument transformer. Many, many years ago when I was still in Bulgaria, I was in a 400 kV substation where a voltage transformer exploded. And you can see the pieces of insulation on the ground with very sharp edges. And you can imagine if you're there when this thing explodes, you're gone. 
So this is becoming one of the drivers for many utilities to look into alternative sensors that are capable of reducing the safety concerns that people may have. I did a workshop many, many years ago at, uh, in Mexico at CFE regarding digital substations and when I asked them why are they looking at optical CTs, they said because of safety issues. The year before they had seven cases when a CT exploded in one of their substations and that's why they said we need to look into some of the new technologies in order to avoid these potential problems. Another thing that I hate since my very early days as a protection engineer is wiring. Because wiring, first of all, is very time consuming to uh, commission the substation. I was in a, in a, a panel building plant and when I was walking around, I asked one of the managers, how long does it take for one of these wired connections between two relays? And he told me it takes, on average, about 15 minutes from the time they look at the print, they cut the wire with the required length, they strip it, they put the tags on it, they wire it, they test it. It takes about 15 minutes. So. This is becoming a very significant driver for many people to switch into what I call hybrid substations where they're replacing the wiring between the relays with goose messages because simply people cannot find enough technicians to do the wiring of the substation. So they're saying we can much quicker deliver the substations if we replace the hard wiring with the goose. Also the flexibility is much better and I can tell you a story but I have no time to do that. <coughs> okay, so why are we doing it? I think it is becoming clear with some of the challenges that I mentioned to you. But also we live in a new world. This is a world where we have the a changing grid that is driven by the high penetration of distributed energy resources. I think wherever I've been in Germany, I see either large numbers of PV panels on the rooftops of farms or houses, and here and there you see a large wind generator just sitting by itself producing power in the middle of nowhere. And all of this has to be integrated However, the integration of this kind of equipment is very challenging because it behaves completely different from what we are familiar with as protection engineers. We are familiar with large synchronous machines that have a specific dynamic behavior and now we are dealing with predominantly inverter-based technology that has no inertia and behaves completely differently from what we know, imposing significant challenges on the implementation of protection, automation and control systems. At the same time, we have requirements for improving the reliability and the security of the grid. We can even, uh, it's very difficult to take outages, for example, to do testing, to do maintenance testing and things like that. So we have to improve the efficiency of the protection, automation and control systems based on the changing technology and also the changing workforce. Now, this is something that is positive and negative at the same time. We have a lot of people that are coming in the industry without significant experience, but at the same time, they are much more flexible in the adaptation of the new technology. And I think this is very, very positive because these are people that are open-minded which makes the acceptance of the new technology of today much easier because of the fact that they're used to dealing with screens instead of dealing with screwdrivers. Okay, so uh, for the smart grid, one of the key requirements is reliability. And I picked up this picture because actually imagine if your target is the one on the left, and actually it is 
a short circuit condition. Imagine if you are not able every single time to properly detect this fault condition, detect the location of the fault and properly clear it in order to maintain the reliability and stability of the electric power grid. It's going to be a nightmare and this is why reliability is one of the key requirements that we need to achieve with the protection automation and control systems of today. At the same time, I mentioned the requirement for efficiency. What does it mean? It means that, for example, we need to improve the quality of everything that we deliver, any project that we put in service. We need to improve the speed of the delivery of the project, and at the same time, we need to improve the speed of the performance of the protection automation and control systems. And at the same time, the results that we accomplish based on the design of our protection automation and control systems have to be the most positive possible. And at the same time, we need to accomplish this by reducing costs. And when we talk about reducing costs, actually we can map pretty much any criteria that you use in your everyday work to cost. Because, for example, if you reduce the time that it will take you to do maintenance testing, this is cost. If you reduce the traveling, if you reduce the money that you have to spend, there are many, many different things that at the end of the day you can summarize as reduced cost. So this is what means improved efficiency meeting what you see on this slide. Now, when we think about protection, automation and control, I already talked about the grid and I talked about the basic components, the, the uh, primary equipment and then the different uh, operations functions. So we need to deal with the grid in two different groups of conditions. One is when we have abnormal operating conditions, meaning short circuit faults, lightning strikes, open conductors, etc., etc. We need to be able to properly detect them even under the most challenging conditions and then make the proper decision of what is the action to take to mitigate this condition in order to maintain the stability and reliability of the electric power grid. So how do we do that? We do this with protection. And the most typical form of protection that we have been using for more than 100 years is the transmission line protection based on distance protection. However, using overcurrent protection and distance protection has been okay for all these more than 100 years because we trip most of the faults without time delay in zone one However, there are still some faults that we trip with a zone to time delay if we are using overcurrent or distance protection. The problem with that in the world of the smart grid with a high penetration of distributed energy resources is that these resources have what we call a ride through capability, which is the capability for the device, for the generator to withstand the voltage drop during the duration of the fault for a certain period of time. However, if this time is more than a, a couple of hundred milliseconds, we may lose these generators. And this is why this stripping of the fault with zone two may become unacceptable for many locations in the electric power grid. This is why we need to find new ways of dealing with these protection challenges. Another challenge is the inverter-based generation because when you have a fault, I have a fault anywhere on my line and I have inverter-based generation, the inverter does not produce fault current. So what we are starting to deal with now as a challenge to our industry is looking at how are we going to protect the lines with overcurrent protection and distance protection when there is no enough fault current to drive this operating principle. The good news is that we already have traveling wave-based protection that is available on the market and more and more vendors 
are looking at actually uh, delivering this kind of products. We have a lot of experience using traveling waves for uh, fault location, but now it's becoming available for protection. And this looks like the most promising technology to deal with the issue of the inverter-based generation, especially at the distribution level. So I think this gives you an idea that we are getting new technology. However, this technology requires some additional capabilities in our protection, automation, and control solutions that were not widely available in the past. We also need to deal with the electric power grid under normal operating conditions. So what does it mean? It means that we need to have situational awareness at the energy management system level. We need to know what is the power transfer. We need to know what are the angles between different areas of the system. We need to know what is the voltage situation, what is the volvar level available in order to be able to predict any potential wide area disturbances. So this is what we call situational awareness that is based on the availability of synchrophaser measurements from many devices today. The other task that we have under normal conditions is obviously to operate the electric power grid. And this is using different control actions from the control center, from a regional or distribution level control center, or even from the substation HMI itself. Now, the reason I'm talking about all these things is because they're impossible to accomplish without communications. And this is what is becoming the core of the requirements for the successful operation of the electric power grid under normal and abnormal conditions in the smart grid of today and the future. Now, I mentioned already that many of these functions that I'm talking about can be implemented at different levels in the power utility system. They can be implemented at the feeder level, they can be implemented in the bay level, at the voltage level, at the substation level, or at a wide area. Uh, when we talk about what kind of functions do we need in order to implement this kind of functionality, first of all, we have to have a process interface. Because any function that we are implementing as a protection, automation, and control function needs to have information about certain parameters of the electric power system needs to know what is the status of the switch gear in order to determine the real-time topology of the grid that will allow it to adapt its behavior for the changing system conditions. Another issue is the function allocation. Where do we want to implement a function? Do we want to implement it in an IED? Do you want to implement it at a central computer at the substation level? etc etc so this is something a decision that needs to be made how the functions are implemented is also a very interesting issue are they implemented in an integrated device are they implemented as programmable function modules etc etc the function integration is becoming a critical issue for many utilities because they have different philosophies for example when we started talking about using synchrophaser measurements for situational awareness, there was a big fight in many utilities about who is going to control this equipment. Until today, pretty much all the modern microprocessor-based protection relays provide also synchrophaser measurements, so this issue about who is controlling it is starting to disappear. The engineering of the system is another very critical issue because if you make a mistake as part of the engineering of the system and this mistake is not detected by proper testing which unfortunately still happens we may end up with a bad situation that may lead to a wide area disturbance that's why the proper system engineering 
is of very critical importance and it is going to be covered in some of the presentations during uh, this uh, workshop. The same applies for the system testing. How you're going to test the system at the different stages of the life cycle of a protection automation and control system is another critical requirement as well as the system monitoring and I'm going to talk about how this can be accomplished. So finally I'm getting, I think you're starting to already feel that I'm getting to the answer of the last question, how are we doing it? And the answer is us using communications. I think we live in a world that we cannot imagine how we can exist without communications. So what is communications? Again, the definition, a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of symbols, signs or behavior, or a two-way process of reaching mutual understanding, etc., etc. You can find a bunch, but I think this is a suitable one. So what you see here is we are unfortunately changing in a way the communication skills that we have as human beings as communi communication skills between human beings and machines. Because you see, I picked up this picture, because you see these people, these kids are sitting together next to each other, but they're not talking to each other. Each one of them is living in its own virtual world, and I think this is a very, very sad picture. I can almost start crying when I look at it, because where is the human interaction, okay? Anyway, I don't want to get depressed, so I'm going to switch to another communications-related issue. We need to think about which communication method we are using when we talk about protection, automation, and control functionality. So what you see here is you see a, an operator that is talking to somebody. We need to understand that for an operator to talk to somebody, he or she has to use what we call connection-oriented communications. She has to dial the person that she needs to talk to, the person has to pick up the phone, answer, establish a connection, and then they can start talking to each other. Now, imagine if there is a fire in this building, and there is an operator that needs to call each one of us to tell us get out of the room because there is a dangerous condition. This is going to take forever and probably a bunch of people are going to die in this room. A very depressing picture. Luckily, we have a different method for communications, which is connectionless communications. This is the principle of the fire alarm. So I think there are some sensors here and there is alarm over there, so for example, if there is a fire, this is non-solicited communication, the bell starts ringing, telling you there is a dangerous situation, get out of there, and it's non-confirmed, so we don't know who is going to hear it, but it is the fastest way to operate, and this is the two main methods that are available to us when we talk about protection, automation, and control. If I'm to operate the breaker from the control center, I have to select the breaker, I have to get a confirmation that it's selected, and then I can operate on it. This is a connection-oriented communication over the seven layer OSI stack. However, if I'm to send the breaker failure initiate, I'm going to use a connectionless communication. I'm going to just send, there is a fault on my line, do something and somebody is going to do reclosing, somebody is going to do a breaker failure, recording, etc., etc., using the connectionless communications. So this is something very important to uh, understand. In the systems that we have been used to, typically we have a box with the different functions in it that is hardwired to the process. I mentioned the deficiencies with this method and this is why Today we are going into a digitizing of the substation using standalone merging units connected to the secondary of the instrument transformers using low power, merging, uh, low power sensors such as Rogowski calls, 
connected to emerging unit or using optical CTs or VTs with an embedded merging unit that is converting to the sampled values that are required in order to perform the protection automation and control functions. Now, the other transition that we are seeing in the industry is the integration of different switchgear functions in a single device. So what you see here is this part of the figure, most of the figure to the left, which includes the disconnectors and the breaker and the CT, is replaced here with a single physical device. This is what is called a DCB, which means disconnecting circuit breaker, with integrated fiber optic current sensors. And this is a technology that is already available on the market, and you can see the dramatic savings in space for the uh, layout of the substation environment. And this is a picture of such a device yeah. in an existing installation. So this is really a very, very significant change in the technology because this is coming with directly available digital interface to the process, eliminating many of the challenges that I was mentioning earlier. So what is the tool that is available to us to make all this a reality? It is IC61850. This is the glue that allows us to bring all of these pieces together. Now, if you want to blame somebody, this is a group of people that I can say are probably the most responsible for the fact that you are in this room. Because this is a picture from the 10th anniversary of the start of the work on IC61850. It was a working group 10 meeting, actually it was 10, 11 and 12 at the time, that was in Klaus, and you see a couple of people that are in this room uh, in front of you here, uh, that were part of, of this uh, exciting, and I'm sure there are many. So what is 61850 actually? I can talk for days about it, but I really like this UML diagram because it gives you the basic components of the standard. It gives you the hierarchy of the object model on the left and in this purple area all the different control blocks that are used to support the different services that are required within the IC61850 environment in order to meet the requirements of all these different applications that I have been talking about. The allocation of the functions, the distribution of the functions, their functional decomposition using logical nodes is shown on this uh, figure and it gives you an example of how using the sensor logical nodes and then the different measurement, protection, etc. logical nodes, we can build any functionality required for protection, automation and control. This is an example of the functional allocation in a distributed digital substation environment for the implementation of a three-zone distance protection. This is another extremely important component of IC61850. I, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, so this is the system configuration language that allows you to describe absolutely everything that you have in the substation environment in order to properly engineer it using the right configuration and engineering tools. So all of this allows us to implement digital substations starting from the yard, the control, the uh, protection panels, the control house and then finally the grid level and this can be used both for air insulated switch gear or gas insulated switch gear. And these are pictures from different parts of the world that I'm very happy to see digital substations. This is Transgrid in Australia. This is their justification of doing it, but I have no time to talk about it. This is in uh, Louisiana, uh, in New Orleans. This is a picture again from New Orleans. This is from Norway. This is from Scotland, this is from France, an optical city, the panels in, in this same substation with no hard wiring. 
And then this is from Peru, near Lima. And all of this is because of people understanding the benefits of the technology. <coughs> Something new that is starting to happen now is the transition from boxes to centralized protection and control solutions. So this is an example of a centralized protection and control device that can be used to protect up to 20 feeders in a substation. This is the trend for the future. And the real future trend is protection as a service, protection in a cloud. Some people say you're insane. I know there is nothing new, but I really believe that this is the future where we are going and it's not going to be such a distant future. All of this obviously has to be tested in order to be put in operation. And this is why it is very important to have tools, for example, for testing merging units, to have tools that allow you to test distributed applications within the substation, between substations, in wide area networks, system of integrity protection schemes, etc. Or to be able to have a live overview of what is going on in the substation, or to be able to trace actually the different signals in order to identify any potential problem. So having proper tools is a very critical uh, step that is required for the successful implementation of the standard. In digital substations with non-conventional sensors, obviously secondary injection doesn't work. That's why we need to do the testing with primary injection as part of the commissioning. And also another capability available to us is the ability to do remote testing in order to eliminate the trips to the substation under dangerous conditions. I'm finishing. Okay, so in conclusion, I think I proved that P plus AC plus IC61850 equals POOC. And I will stop here and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have with the answer that is on my t-shirt.